to do a, just a quick review of uh, what was covered in the last lecture before uh, trying to uh, you know begin this uh, new lecture. So, the last uh, session we discussed at length about <laughs> the construction of uh, ion selective electrodes. Ion selective electrodes essentially are uh, those electrodes which has a tendency of selecting one or more ions of interest over a bunch of different ions and there are certain modalities uh, which we need to consider before um, you know you explore the how to construct these. Uh, typically, you have to have you know a, a kind of recognition agent or an identifier which can select or which can offer selectivity. So, one way of doing it as we learned last time is uh, basically preparing a polymer paste uh, like uh, polyvinyl chloride and then trying to you know include in it some material uh, which is uh, causing the selectivity or the selection action. Um, one uh, fantastic example was that of valinomycin where these uh, essentially are organic extracts available on the cell membrane and uh, which can help uh, to basically exchange uh, calcium and potassium ions. Okay. And so, if you want to make a, a calcium selective or a potassium selective electrode, uh, you have to uh, have these valinomycin uh, moieties in, in a polymeric material. Uh, the way you prepare the electrode is that you take a thin glass capillary, you dip it and uh, create a plug kind of a thing which is also like a ion exchange membrane and then you basically fill that with um, a certain electrolyte and immerse a conduit which can do the electrical measurement uh, from that electrolyte. Uh, we also talked uh, at length about uh, the various uh, ways, alternative ways and means of uh, making the ion selective electrodes. One of them if you remember was uh, with different, two different oxidant concentrations uh, and, and that avoided the need for uh, you know a, a reference electrolyte uh, as has been the case in all the ISAs. We talked and discussed about some MEMS modules for um, electrochemical sensing of cells wherein we showed the small silicon chip and uh, showed 64 recording channels there uh, where there could be a single cell by single cell isolation and the electrodes could record the response from those cells etc. Then we tried to derive the famous uh, Nernst equation which is also an equation uh, meant for describing the relationship between the EMF and the, the log of concentration. We found out that you know uh, the Nernstian slope is uh, um, equivalent to a parameter s uh, which is essentially 0 0.059 by n, n being the number of electrons which are exchanged in the redox couple. We also uh, tried to estimate the EMF in some uh, numerical problems uh, if the concentration, if, 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 if concentration of a certain analyte is known or vice versa. Okay. And uh, then we talked essentially about how to measure and calibrate <coughs> such electrodes and uh, we discussed about two different techniques, uh, direct measurement wherein uh, you just find out the EMF for a certain concentration uh, using the Nernstian approach and standard addition method where you use a standard concentration and standard volume and then find out uh, the new concentration and from the two EMFs that you get you could actually uh, gauge uh, you know what is the unknown concentration. If the standard concentration and the volume of the unknown solution and volume of standard solution uh, they are all known. Okay, we were just about began to talk about grand plot, and uh, what I'm going to do today is to take uh, you off from here, and uh, go through the grand plot um, just once more for uh, the sake of reviewing, and then do a numerical problem and uh, move ahead. Okay, so <laughs> the third method, uh, which we slightly discussed uh, last day, was the grand plot. You know, this is essentially an extension of the standard addition method. Uh, although in this case several additions say 5 or more uh, are made. Okay. So, in this particular method um, there is you know uh, several additions of uh, known concentration analyte. So, uh, here we define uh, C s as a variable in a manner that the C s essentially is, uh, is uh, a, a concentration uh, where you know it is basically the concentration differential. Okay. So, uh, if you are adding a certain concentration to the unknown concentration of the analyte, the overall concentration that comes out because of this addition of known volumes of the standard and known volumes of the unknown uh, can have uh, or can be represented as the unknown plus a differential, a concentration differential. So, that differential is C s. Okay. So, we are uh, just the redefining uh, you know uh, the parameter C s slightly in a, in a different manner 
and this should be very clear at the outset because um, uh, sometimes there is a confusion uh, because of that in solving numerical problems etc. So, let us suppose that uh, Cs is such a concentration and if you talk about an unknown analyte of concentration Cu, uh, you can find out the EMF from this uh, particular equation K plus uh, S log Cu. This is the Nernstein approach to determine the EMF and uh, let us suppose that after the addition the new concentration becomes Cu plus Cs, okay, Cs being the differential concentration and the new EMF E2 can be written down as K plus S log Cu plus Cs, okay. So, if this uh, is treated as equation 2 here, you know, uh, let us suppose this is equation 1, this is equation 2. Uh, the equation 2 can be again uh, redefined as uh, E2 by S equals K by S plus log of Cu plus Cs, okay. And therefore, 10 to the power of E2 by S equal to K dash times of Cu plus Cs. And uh, K dash essentially here is 10 to the power of K by S. Uh, let us now plot Cs with E to the power of uh, 10 to the power of E2 by S, okay. So, uh, essentially uh, this uh, equation here, equation 3 is just like a straight line. So, between Cs and 10 to the power E2 by S, uh, the relationship is something like um, y is equal to mx plus c. So, if we plot that it would be a straight line as we found out last time. So, this essentially is a plot between 10 to the power of e by s and uh, the, the standard concentration c s, okay. And uh, you can find out, let us suppose we have made uh, 5 or 6 such additions, okay, 5 to 6 additions and each time you measure what is uh, the new emf and the differential of the emf and you plot the straight line based on the several points which come as observation points between 10 to the power of E by S and C S, okay. So, if we just uh, look at the equation slightly differently, uh, equation here, uh, equation 2 is 10 to the power of E by S equals K dash times of C U plus C S, okay. So, what happens when 10 to the power of E by S becomes 0, okay. So, essentially this you are extending the line all the way back to a point here where 10 to the power E by S is 0. So, this would correspond to a concentration which is minus C u. Now, minus really does not have any physical meaning here except the fact that we can actually gauge the magnitude of the unknown concentration. C u by looking at the standard addition differential C s. So, it is all about how to calculate C s, okay, which is important in this particular case. So, you know, the essentially we have to find out a way of determining C s in such cases and I am going to take you through a numerical problem where exactly the same thing would be done, okay. So, in this problem as you see we have 50 centimeter cube of a solution, okay. So, there is a copper plus 2 uh, you know salt solution of copper mm, the cuprous state and this was analyzed by using a multiple standard addition method or the grand plot method okay and when uh, it is found that when 1 centimeter cube increments that means every time the volume added of the un, uh, the, the standard concentration is 1 centimeter cube so 1 centimeter cube increments of 0 0.1 molar cu2 is added Okay, so, 0 0.1 molar is basically the, the value of the known concentration um, of the standard concentration of uh, the additive solution and they were added to the test sample and their EMF readings were taken. So, the table here represents the relationship between the volumes that are added and the corresponding EMF that happens because of that. So, if you add 1 centimeter cube of volume of uh, Cu plus 2 0 0.1 molar solution to this 50 centimeter cube of a solution of the original solution, the EMF obtained is 99.8 millivolts and this goes all the way up to about 5 increments. So, every time you are adding 1 increment in each uh, particular instance, uh, 1 becomes 2 overall volume, 2 becomes overall volume, 3, 3 becomes overall volume, 4 or and so on and so forth. So, when you have added at the end of the day after 5 increments, the volume 50 centimeter cube gets increased by 5 centimeter cube, the EMF found out in that case is 107.9 millivolts. 
So, if we assume that the blank solution, that means, you know, essentially uh, the solution which uh, had the unknown concentration of the analyte, uh, uh, that gave a reading of 70 millivolts, then uh, we essentially have to estimate the concentration of copper in the original solution. So, this is again a simple problem just on the grand plot method. Let us just uh, see or look into the solution aspect. So, if you look at, let us say we draw an alternate table here, where we put the volume added in one in centimeter cube incremental volume. Uh, Let us see what is the concentration change because of this addition a 0.1 molar uh, you know concentration 1 centimeter cube addition every time. And uh, we talk in terms of how many millimolar uh, concentration increase happens because of this addition. And then the in the fourth column we also uh, note down the various EMFs with respect to the blank concentration. So, if you remember in the in the you know in the equation for the grand plot, uh, you are talking about a term 10 to the power of E by S right in the right side uh, on in the left side. And essentially this E is nothing but E 1 my or E 2 minus E 1 ok. So, E 1 essentially is the is the blank solutions EMF or the, the solution which has the unknown concentration the EMF generated by it. So, it has been given in the equation that this E 1 is 70 millivolts uh, that is a part of the question. So, essentially we are trying to just calculate this E difference between E 2 and E 1 and so if E 2 is 99.8 as has been given earlier E 2 is 99.8 centimeter cube uh, oh sorry a uh, millivolts then um, uh, the, the difference between E 2 and E 1 is written here E as 29.8 millivolts. And similarly, this goes true for all the different other readings which uh, have been mentioned in the earlier table. Okay. We also compute assuming that uh, uh, you know the, the S to be uh, 59 millivolts um, you know per decade. So, essentially we are assuming a 1 electron actually it is a 2 electron transfer process because it is Cu plus 2 state. So, we assume a 2 electron transfer process and so that would become 25.29.5 uh, uh, okay, millivolts. So, you divide uh, this uh, 10 to and uh, the, the divide E the E that is obtained in the earlier column here by the S value which is 29.5 millivolts and you obtain 10 to the power of E by S in this manner as these different entries. Okay. So, once you do that you are left with the 10 to the power of E by S value, you are also left with the concentration and let us now explore how the concentration difference is calculated here. So, if you add 1 centimeter cube of solution to 50 centimeter cube of the parent solution. Okay. So, you have 50 centimeter cube of the parent solution and you are adding 1 centimeter cube to it. So, the total volume would be 51 centimeter cube and uh, you are adding 0 0.1 molar solution which means that uh, uh, you essentially add 1 by 51 times of you know a fraction of volume of 0 0.1 molar. Molar if you remember is moles per liter. Okay. And here you are essentially talking about a volume fraction of the new solution with respect to the old solution. So, that we can consider as the fraction of the liter okay, in which 0 0.1 moles are existent. So, effectively the number of uh, moles which are added here because of this addition comes out to be 1 times of 0 0.1 by 51. As you keep on increasing you add 2 centimeter cube, you add 3 centimeter cube, 4 centimeter cube, 5 centimeter cube. So, essentially the total volume changes every time 52, 53, 54, 55 and therefore, the, the number of moles added each time are different on the ratio of uh, 2 times 0 0.1 by 52, 3 times 0 0.1 by 53, 4 times 0 0.1 by 54 so on so forth. So, you are obtaining essentially uh, the molar concentration here and then trying to find out what is number of millimoles okay and so essentially this millimolar concentration is represented here okay so essentially uh, when you talk about this grand plot 
you have to plot the concentration versus on the x axis and 10 to the power of e by s on the y axis. I am not going to show you the plot here, but then essentially when you take that plot and try to find out the corresponding concentration at the value 10 to the power of e by s equal to 0 or for a 0 reading of the y axis, it comes out to be 0 0.0175 molar. Okay? So, that is how you can actually use the grand plot to an advantage to gauge the, the unknown. So, this is also the concentration of the unknown solution uh, of the analyte uh, Cu plus 2, 50 centimeter of uh, cube of which had been taken at uh, the outset uh, in this particular experiment. Okay? So, this is the way you actually calculate the unknown concentration using the grand plot method. Let us, uh, let me now take you to a very interesting, uh, you know, parameter the ion activity and I have been talking about this off and on in my last lectures uh, where uh, we actually see uh, that in many cases, uh, especially in uh, micro devices when the solution volume considered is very small, uh, it is essentially a big deal uh, if there are uh, more than one participating ions. Okay? And uh, there sometimes the concentration term really gets uh, uh, kind of reintroduced as a fraction of the concentration which is participating for the electron exchange process. And uh, that is very obvious because there are uh, interactions between these other ions which uh, are around uh, the ion of interest. Right? There are forces of attraction, repulsion and def definitely there is going to be some kind of a change because of that. So, therefore, uh, if uh, you know in, in such a situation. Uh, it is uh, kind of advisable that you find out or you replace the concentration with a term called activity, an ion activity. And essentially, we can in a more proper manner define ionic activity as uh, uh, you know, uh, since the properties of one species are affected by the presence of other ions which they interact electrostatically uh, with the species of interest. Therefore, the concentration of the species is an unsatisfactory parameter for predicting the bulk properties of the solution. So, what is needed is a parameter similar and related to the ionic concentration, but then which is the actual number of ions present, uh, the concentration is of course the actual number of ions present in the solution. But uh, this parameter that we are talking about is essentially something which expresses the availability of the species to determine the properties. Okay? to take part in chemical reaction and to influence the position of the equilibrium. So, we are talking about when there are competing species, the equilibrium really not is the actual case when there is a single concentration of the species which is available. There are in fact multiple concentrations in this case and therefore, uh, it is very natural to assume that what plays an important role is the reduced concentration, okay, so the effective concentration of uh, the ions which are uh, participating in the reaction. So, this parameter is also known as the activity of a particular species. All right, So, it is essentially a factor. So, essentially uh, instead of the C i, the concentration of the species, we replace uh, the C i by another parameter A i, the activity uh, which is equal to gamma i times of C i. Gamma is of course, the activity coefficient here right? and C i is the concentration of the ith, ith term and that is what essentially it is. So, uh, the chemical potential uh, which is also the Gibbs free energy okay, of a particular uh, system, uh, let us say it is mu i or delta g or whatever of the ith species, it can be represented as delta g 0 mu i 0 times of R t l n x i times of gamma x. Okay. Now, as you see here, what is important for me to tell you here is that this term here which is actually uh, nothing but if you had looked into the earlier, uh, you know, earlier derivations, etc. This was the concentration of the oxidant has been replaced by the activity of the oxidant or the ionic species. Okay, so definitely there is going to be some kind of a change in the overall way that EMF is found or in the overall way that uh, the delta G is estimated because of this. Let us actually look what happens. Uh, when you put pick uh, you know solution with various ions uh, positive as well as negative and uh, essentially uh, in terms of ion ion or ion solvent interaction there are a lot of uh, a lot of you know events which happen once you have such a combination of ions and you have an electric field 
uh, which is you know uh, trying to uh, separate these ions so uh, what what are uh, what are the what are the main uh, mechanisms of movement of ions one uh, mechanism is their violent thermal motion right the ions have almost always a so called random walk process because of thermal energy which is inherent to any system and uh, these ions would kind of walk randomly within the solution that is one kind of motion then there are coulombic forces between the ions of same or opposite kinds um, opposite kinds attract each other same of course repel each other but then there are such coulombic forces which which would uh, predominate uh, you know the, uh, the 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 motion of such some kind of ions okay and uh, essentially <coughs> um, this would uh, the, the coulombic forces between ions of same and opposite kinds will be present which uh, leads to a time average ion atmosphere of one kind with respect to the other so suppose there is a central ion which is um, let's say a positive ion and uh, you have a, a cloud of uh, negative ions around it so uh, these would result into a time average defect because forces are continuously happening okay inside the solution so under an electric field uh, there would be a tendency of this uh, this counter ion cloud to far go towards the negative electrode because the counter ion is positive in this case and the ion of interest which is the negative ion going towards the positive electrode and that case what happens is there is a kind of smearing right so the ion cloud tries to move away from the from the main ion of interest and then there are several such clouds as these ions clutter around and from one cloud to another there would be a change in the central ion okay so it is a it's a completely random process and then there is also a viscous drag that whenever there is such kind of a uh, unidirectional flow of materials of charges there is also a, a viscous drag uh, of this because they are in fluids right of the different ions uh, with respect to the surrounding okay so uh, so if we try to model something uh, where we can really get an estimate of what is the participation level of an independent ion okay in that case uh, it is uh, a very difficult model i mean kinematically or dynamically if you are able to investigate it's one of the great things so since in, in, from 1923 onwards we do have a model and that's exactly what i want to point out here that uh, uh, just give me a minute that until uh, uh, 1923 the activity coefficient uh, was uh, really uh, uh, experimentally predicted and that was almost always Uh, the case there was no other means to accurately find the the activity coefficient but then in 1980 when in 1923 they, there were uh, there was a mechanism which was drawn out uh, in terms of a certain set of equations called debye huckel equations and debye huckel theory which would be able to predict the activity using all these different constraint constraints about ion ion or ion solvent interaction that uh, i talked about in the last slide so let me try and you know uh, give you an idea of how we can predict the activity of an ion mathematically from looking at the dynamics and the kinematics of such a reaction right so so until 1923 uh the activity coefficients were predicted only experimentally right post 1923 the activities were mathematically predicted using the debye huckel theory of solvated ion transport okay so let us suppose and i'm actually going to derive this okay now i'm just going to derive how we can predict the activity so let us suppose there is a positive ion here okay and uh, there is a potential phi somewhere close to this ion 
potential by potential we mean it is the uh, you know essentially it is uh, basically field per unit length okay so there is uh, almost always a, a, per, uh, a field uh, field times length okay so essentially uh, the electric field is uh, nothing but the but the gradient of uh, the potential so there is a potential uh, around the central ion which exists and let us suppose that at infinity distance from this ion there is a distribution of charge of plus and minus kind okay per centimeter or per unit volume so as n plus 0 and n minus 0 so essentially we are talking about there is an ion of interest here as you see in this uh, particular case there is a potential very close to that ion and there is a distribution of uh, positive and negative ions at a distance infinity from this central ion central positive ion of interest okay so we want to find out the amount of work that would be done in order to transfer a small amount of charge from infinity to this point here which has a potential phi and uh, as you know we can safely assume that potential uh, is also inversely related to um, you know to essentially of distance so therefore at infinity the potential is zero okay so there is no potential due to this ion uh, a positive ion of interest at a distance infinity uh, from uh, it okay so if i want to bring in uh, some positive charge let's say with a valency z plus okay so what would be the charge if we assume epsilon to be the electron electronic charge 1.9 into 10 to the power of minus 16 coulomb okay so essentially we are talking about z plus times of epsilon and let's suppose uh, this is the amount of positive charge and minus z minus epsilon is the amount of negative charge so the amount of work which would be done in order to bring this charge at a point phi would be nothing but plus z plus epsilon psi right this is the amount of work which is done to bring the positive charge to a point near to the central positive charge similarly in order to bring the negative charge near to this point phi uh, the amount of work which would be done is negative z minus epsilon phi okay so this is the work done to bring the negative charge to a point near to central ion of course uh, you have to do positive work in order to bring the positive charge to the positive center and uh, automatically the negative charge would come by attraction uh, onto the positive center okay so you basically the, it will it, the system will automatically do the work so this part is very clear right so, uh, that what happens in the near vicinity of the positive charge okay so now let us look at what really is going to be the distribution near uh, such a point or on and such a point let's call this point a okay let's call this uh, particular point near this where the phi is the potential as the point a all right so at a uh, let us compute what is the charge distribution at a given 
the charge distribution at infinite distance from this charge. So, this is also known as uh, you know it is also given from the Boltzmann distribution. Okay. So, without going into the details of what Boltzmann distribution is, I am simply going to write uh, that from Boltzmann distribution the charge density at A, remember the point A at uh, which the potential was phi in the last slide. Okay. So, the positive charge distribution will be given by uh, looking at the positive charge distribution at infinity times exponential to the power of minus zeta plus psilon phi by k t. So, this essentially is the work done by k t, k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the ambient temperature around the point A or at which the point A is existing. Similarly, uh, the negative charge density is also related to the negative charge density as infinity times e to the power of plus z minus psilon phi by k t. One has to assume that uh, this is a this is a self driven process, this is a temperature dependent process. Okay. So, if you have a temperature t, it automatically means that you know there can be a relationship between without doing any external work of course, uh, there is a relationship between um, you know um, the density at uh, the charge density at infinity and the charge density at the point A at which the potential is phi. Okay. So, the just uh, for the sake of clarity K is also called the Boltzmann constant. right and uh, the particular n here let me call it n i whether it is positive or negative is uh, the number of ions per unit volume the number of ions per unit volume at a Okay. So, really the electrical density at A can be represented as n plus z plus psilon right minus n minus z minus epsilon. Remember z plus and z minus are the positive and negative valencies. Okay. Why we need valencies is because when we are talking about ion transport there has to be an idea of whether it is a negative ion or a positive ion. What is going to be the total amount of charge electronic charge that that ion contains. So, therefore, z plus or z minus uh, are essentially very very important to be included uh, in the equation because they are a function of any ions oxidation or reduction state. Okay. So, the total charge density uh, that means charge per unit volume, okay. this is charge per unit volume rho is given by n plus z plus e minus n minus z minus e. So, from equations here 1 and 2, we can substitute what is the values of n plus and n minus and write the final charge density rho as uh, equal to n plus 0 z plus epsilon e to the power of minus z plus epsilon phi by k t okay, minus n minus 0 z minus psilon e to the power of plus 
z minus epsilon phi by k t all right. So, we have the final electrical charge density as uh, you know simply a, a difference between the n plus 0 z plus epsilon and n minus 0 z minus epsilon e to the power of minus z plus epsilon phi by k t e to the power of plus z minus epsilon phi by k t. So, that is the overall electrical density at A, the electrical density at A. So, let us use uh, Taylor series to expand this a little bit and also to approximate it. Okay. So, uh, as we know from uh, you know elementary mathematics that uh, if we use Taylor series in such a situation, uh, you can have e to the power of x being predicted by 1 plus x by 1 factorial plus x square by 2 factorial plus so on so forth. Okay. Okay. So, neglecting the higher order terms we are left with an estimation of e to the power x as 1 plus x. If we assume x to be small enough uh, we can really safely ignore the higher orders. Now, if we look at the equation uh, which we predicted in the earlier um, you know expression here we have this, uh, this important factor epsilon which is 10 to the power of minus 19 okay. and uh, you know e by k also is uh, probably going to be uh, in a very small order um, and therefore, the overall term z plus epsilon phi by k t is uh, really you know it is really very small it is insignificant and therefore, the higher orders of such a term can be safely uh, neglected in the equation. So, if we put this back into our earlier equation here on charge density, the density of charge rho would come out to be equal to n plus 0 z plus epsilon times of 1 minus z plus epsilon phi by k t. Okay, so, basically as, as we are talking the charge density here is uh, essentially given by n plus 0 z plus epsilon 1 minus z plus epsilon phi xi by k t uh, from the Taylor approximation and uh, this is the positive density and the negative density is minus n minus 0 z minus epsilon. one minus z minus epsilon phi by k t. Okay. So, essentially uh, that is how you indicate uh, both you know uh, the plus as well as the minuses. Okay. And uh, uh, so, when we are talking about uh, 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 so, so this is this this is really the overall charge density also, uh, uh, which which we are, we are investigating. So uh, if we just open the brackets and trying to do a little bit of simplification here, we are left with uh, z n plus zero z minus epsilon, okay, minus n plus zero z, oh sorry z plus epsilon minus n plus 0 z plus square epsilon square phi by k t all right minus n minus 0 z minus epsilon plus n minus 0 z minus square epsilon square psi by k t okay 
Um, uh, so basically, um, I'm sorry, this uh, was actually a plus because if you go back here, if you look at what the density is, this is essentially e to the power of z minus epsilon phi by k and uh, this was a little uh, typo error here uh, while writing this. This will be 1 plus x, okay, 1 plus z minus epsilon phi and kt resulting in this uh, sign here to be changing into um, minus. Okay. So, uh, let us just rearrange the terms that we have so far and then we are left with n plus 0 z plus epsilon minus n minus 0 z minus epsilon as one bracket and minus of this whole other term you know n plus 0 essentially z plus square epsilon square phi by k t and plus n minus 0 z minus I am sorry as uh, due to the you know space considerations let us write this term on the on the bottom here. So, we are left with the second term here which is uh, give me a minute uh, plus n minus 0 z minus square epsilon square phi over k t bracket closed. Okay. Yeah. So, there are several interesting things to be shared here. Uh, one is that uh, this particular term which uh, we are talking about here has to be 0. Okay. And why that is so is that this is also the principle of electrical neutrality, principle of electrical neutrality. Now, I just need to explain why that is so. So, this principle essentially states that uh, if you are talking about uh, you know positive and negative charges in a certain solution there is automatically uh, you know a chance of these to be redistributed in a manner so that the overall medium is electrically neutral so there should be equal number of positive and equal number of negative charges in that extent so here when we are talking about the charges at infinity is placed from this point to the central ion which is a positive ion uh, the total amount of charge that we are talking in terms of you know let us say the valency on the positive charge is z plus the valency on the negative charge is z minus and the, uh, the distribution of the charges per unit volume at infinity is n plus 0 and n minus 0. So, really the total positive charge that we have at infinity per unit volume is n plus 0 z plus times of epsilon epsilon being the electronic charge and the total amount of negative charge that we have at infinity from this point A where the potential is phi is n minus 0 z minus epsilon. So, they should be exactly equal and opposite or in other words the summation of these charges should be 0 or the medium in general should be electrically neutral. So, therefore, the first term here really is a 0 term. It is uh, a total uh, you know uh, there is there is absolutely no charge or it is a neutral charge. The second term here is essentially of importance to us because that in a sense is what the charge density uh, really is and let us actually write it down in the next slide. So, the second term rho effectively becomes minus n plus square n n plus 0 z plus square epsilon square phi by k t plus n minus 0 z minus square epsilon square phi by k t. What is interesting here to be seen is that we can actually notate this in a slightly different way. Okay. So, what I am doing now is really not from the standpoint of algebra, but from the standpoint of notation. And the idea is that if this notation is continued just for convenience sake throughout the equations and we do understand what it means at the end of the day, then we are very clear about what has to be done. So, I would say that this thing be represented by sigma n i z i square epsilon square phi by k t 
okay, where the notation is such that i takes care of all negatives and all positives, uh, positive charges in the medium. Okay. So, I is something which is a generic subscript which if we were to actually take all these ions together and number them as 1, 2, 3, 4 so on whether it is positive or negative or irrespective of whether it is positive or negative then we are actually having I number of ions in the solution and therefore uh, whether it is uh, you know uh, a plus uh, charge density or a uh, you know plus positive valency or whether it is a negative charge density or a negative valency can be subscripted by the subscript i as you can see here in this particular you know equation okay so we are left with uh, the charge density approximately uh, to be ni sigma ni zi square epsilon square phi by kt where i is the number of the total number of charges irrespective of whether it is positive or negative charge all right so all said and done uh, let us actually call this equation equation number 1 okay for uh, the sake of convenience so let us now look at a little different aspect as to what this electrostatic potential phi would be or how we can calculate the electrostatic potential phi you know at the point a near to the positive ion so let's say that um, we want to determine the phi at a so one way of doing that would be by using the uh, the poisson's equation which uh, gives a spatial relationship of the the potential function around a charge uh, with respect to the density of the charge which is available at that particular point. So, uh, we can write it, write the Poisson's equation and I am really not going into the details of how the Poisson's equation is derived because that is uh, essentially going to be uh, the curriculum for a you know a second year. Uh, graduate course in mathematics, but essentially we would like to use this equation and try to solve for the potential function phi in interest of our um, finding out the overall activity of an ion or ionic species. So, we have the double def derivative of uh, phi with respect to x plus uh, the double partial derivative of uh, uh, psi with respect to y plus uh, the double partial derivative of phi with respect to uh, z the potential function is the is the phi of the xi and that essentially can be equated to the overall charge density uh, and the dielectric constant d of the medium this d is essentially the dielectric constant of the medium okay the ability of a medium also to give way to or, or to store um, uh, a charge okay so this is the dielectric constant of the medium And so, essentially, the Poisson's equation is the relationship uh, between the variation of uh, potential function with respect to all the three coordinates, and it gives a relationship between the that variation and uh, the charge density of uh, an atmosphere of which the phi is to be considered of. Okay, so the first thing we would like to do is because we are talking about spherical charges, we would like to uh, transform you know the coordinates of this particular equation into um, the, the, the spherical coordinates. So, we are considering spherical charges right. If you may remember we were talking about a positive charge which is spherical and the atmosphere <coughs> around this particular charge. So, essentially we would do a coordinate transformation. from the above mentioned Cartesian form this one right to a spherical co 
coordinate system. Okay. So, in order to do that, I would just uh, like to illustrate how you would be able to change this, but then um, I it is expected that uh, you basically uh, you know in one of the homework assignments as I would be giving later on uh, do and show the derivation and this can be uh, this is available in any of the uh, as I told you before first or second year uh, graduate textbooks on elementary engineering mathematics okay. Okay, so uh, let us look at how this uh, this coordination transformation would be done. Um, so let us suppose we have uh, a, a Cartesian coordinate here x, y, z. Okay. So, essentially uh, this is the x minus x, this is uh, the y minus y is z minus z. Okay. Now, we draw a sphere here somewhere in the center and we assume that uh, there is a radius vector r uh, essentially of the sphere projected in the three dimensions from its center which is uh, the geometrical center x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0 and z is equal to 0. Okay. So, let us uh, further assume that uh, we take the projection of, uh, of this r vector onto the x y plane. All right. So, this is the projection of the r vector onto the x y plane and we assume that uh, the angle between the projection of the r vector on the x y plane and the r vector is gamma. All right. So, automatically uh, this uh, uh, z value comes out to be equal to r <coughs> sin gamma. All right. So, this is 90 minus gamma. So, r sin gamma is the z value. So, what happens to the x and y value? Uh, let us further assume that uh, essentially the you know the um, uh, the projection vector of the r on the x y plane is at an angle theta with respect to the y coordinate okay so in that case um, the the corresponding y value uh, here corresponding to this radius vector would be equal to r sin gamma cos theta right and the x value would be equal to r sin gamma, I am sorry, r cos gamma. Uh, so, essentially uh, this thing is cos, it is also cos. So, r cos gamma cos theta and r cos gamma sin theta. Okay. So, this is what the y and the x values are. Uh, this is essentially nothing but you know uh, the the projection of the point x y z at the end of the radius vector with respect to the various angles that the radius vector makes with the projection on the y z the x y plane and essentially uh, the projection of a projection on the y and the x coordinate okay so once uh, these three vectors are figured out um, you know transforming the coordinates would essentially mean uh, uh, you have to do d phi by d x uh, as d phi by d um, r times of d r plus d phi by d times of d x by d r okay. d x uh, d r by d x I am sorry times of times of d r by d x plus uh, d phi by d gamma times of d gamma by d x plus d phi by d theta times of d theta by dx. So, essentially this is a, a actually nothing but a you know a, a total a, a per partial differential of phi with respect to x when x is dependent on the various parameters r you know gamma and theta. Okay. Thank you.